Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. Today's book is an old favorite of mine. Um, I mean, most of these are, of course, but this is a particularly old favorite of mine. This is a children's book, and this is a book that's not great literature. This is not one of the great classics. This is not a book that I would ever recommend be put on the list of great classics. This is a book that holds its place in history due to, I suppose, the nature of popular writing. I suspect a lot of people who wind up listening to this, all 12 subscribers I have, assuming any of you get around to watching this, um, a lot of you will remember Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. Nancy Drew is a teenage girl who runs around and solves mysteries and has a boyfriend who's kind of just there because a girl should have a boyfriend. And the Hardy Boys were a couple of teenage boys who ran around and solved mysteries, and each of them was aimed at, well, respectively girls or boys. The Bobsy Twins were aimed at a slightly younger set, but the one thing that the Bobsy Twins had that Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys didn't was that the the Bobsy Twins are unisex. Not not that the characters are unisex. I mean, this book was written in 1941. Nobody's going to be, you know, unisex or pansexual or anything else like that. No, what these books are about is about a family with two sets of twins. The older twins, Nan and Bert, and the younger twins, Freddie and Flossie. There are, there is, therefore, two boys, two girls. The adventures that and excitement that happen in these books involve both boys and girls, and they, they all get equal metaphorical screen time. And so, the one attraction that these books would have for a parent looking for books for younger readers is that you can give these books to boys or girls because there are boys and there are girls. Now, this is, as I mentioned offhandedly, an older book. This is from 1941, and some of the uh, issues of the age do crop up. The girls tend to stick to doing girlier things, and the boys get to do manlier things. And um, in one of those... Things I didn't notice as a kid, they have a colored servant who, she is unfortunately the stereotype of the happy black cook slash maid. Um, but that being said, while she is that stereotype, there were no negative stereotypes of black people in these books. That is... There were no black people who were declared to be lazy just because they were black or stupid just because they were black. Um, again, one might want to be somewhat more careful with these books in our current supposedly enlightened age, but these are not books that have under that have a, a, a layer of racial tension hiding underneath things. So this particular book is The Bobsy Twins at the Ice Carnival by Laura Lee Hope. There never was a Laura Lee Hope. Like with the Hardy Boys books and like with Nancy Drew, Laura Lee Hope is the pen name of the stable of writers who all wrote these. This is, like in the Archie comics, a collection of books where you write to a particular style, you write to a particular form, and you use the name. There are, by the way, for the record, uh, Bobsy Twins books that were written as recently as the early 90s. Um, I believe it was the early 90s. It might have been the mid-80s. But, um, so there are more modern books in this series, um, in the same way that there are Carolyn Keene books further along for, I believe it was Nancy Drew who had Carolyn Keene. Um, but this was one of my favorites, and part of that was because I was a big figure skating aficionado when I was a kid. Um, 
you know, I rooted for Saria Bonnelly, even though everybody knew she wasn't going to win because she was both black and French, and those were both the kiss of death in figure skating. Um, also because she never actually landed those quads she was trying in competition, which was a problem. But the thing is that what I enjoyed about these books, aside from the fact that there was no irreparable unending girliness in them that, you know, there was, there were just adventures. Um, but what I liked about these books was that they were simple and uncomplicated and fun. And in this particular one, it starts off with a sort of a mystery who set fire to Mr. and Mrs. Cape's house just down the street, and why? I don't think we ever find out why in this book, but that doesn't really matter, because this isn't a book with deep insights into the human condition. This is just a series of adventures and misadventures of four children who have unholy luck. Um, and so the book, in this book, the... Uh, Mr. Cape is apparently a figure skater of some note, and he's going to, there's going to be a, a winter fair up north in Moosehead. I'm not entirely certain that the Bobsy Twins are ever given a particular location, although it's, uh, it's been a while since I've double-checked. Um, I did of course just read this book, but I wasn't paying close attention to whether this had actually tried to locate these books in a real place beyond somewhere in the United States that has enough, that is sufficiently north to have snow. Um, so the twins go to the ice carnival and Bert Bobsey, the eldest brother, is constantly trying to capture uh, the villain of the piece, the man who set fire to um, who set fire to Mr. Cape's home, uh, his name being Beanie Ferris. And the children have an ongoing feud with a local bully, Danny Rugg, whose parents also took him on vacation up to this ice carnival. And there's an exciting series of events because their Aunt Sally uh, inherited a inherited a hotel from her nephew and the hotel is being staffed by terrible staff who are all just awful people and she has to fire them and there's a series of emergencies and near constant flailing in this book it's sort of and the Bobsy twins had a great time on the sleigh ride and then they came home and everyone was flailing because the hotel was falling apart so Nan Bobsy solved everybody's problems with a phone call and then everything was fantastic and then everybody started flailing the next day when this thing happened so Bob uh, so Bert Bobsy fixed everything by doing something by tackling somebody. It's it's a lot like that. Um, they're they're very light reading. They're very silly, but frankly, I think that they're they're good fun books for kids. Um, this one also includes two illustrations. These aren't heavily illustrated books, but. If you look at this, this particular picture is kind of descriptive of almost the style of writing in its way, that you have this cheerful view of the world, this simple view of the world, these happy, lovely people dancing around, and this girlish figure over here is Bert Bobsey, actually. Um... I, 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 who knows. Um, this is an incident in the book when the children all go for a walk in the mountains and somebody and a bunch of local people have built a huge snowman and have swept uh, Flossie Bobsy up and put her on the snowman's shoulder and everybody's happily dancing to uh, Bert's tune. And then Danny Rugg gets himself into trouble, and while they're all off rescuing Danny Rugg from his own foolish misadventures, they forget that they left Flossie sitting on top of the snowman, and she has to try to make her way home, and has a rather startling and upsetting incident where 
um, she winds up accidentally hitting a bull moose in the eye with her, uh, with one of her mittens, which luckily takes the moose so aback that it walks off again. Um, and, and it's, it's a series of misadventures like that. She doesn't come to any harm. Everybody eventually remembers her and then they run around desperately looking for her and eventually find her stuck in a crevasse with a twisted ankle. But everything's fine. Um, and, you know, this is, here is the other thing, which is Nan Bobsey presenting the Diamond Key, because this is one of those fairs where they decide to name a king and queen of the fair, and so there's all four Bobsey twins, Nan Bobsey presenting the key, and, uh, Bert Bobsey with his wig, which has been accidentally drenched in perfume because... Little Freddy Bobsey over here on the left managed to trip and fall and get perfume all over poor Bert's wig. And Bert spends the entire time that they're in the parade in agony that people will think he perfumed his wig himself because he's probably about 13 years old. And I can't imagine many 13-year-olds who want people to think that, that this wig that they're wearing, they've gone out of their way to soak it in women's perfume. Um, on the right there, of course, are the king and queen of the carnival. Um, which I'm sure we've all run across that particular, that particular sort of event or, or, uh, practice, if you will, in a great many fairs and carnivals. In any event, um, so they, they manage to, of course, befriend the king and queen of the fair, because of course they do. They're the Bobsy twins. And uh, they get to wear pretty costumes and participate in the fair full hilt. It's, as I said, it's a series of adventures and misadventures and excitement. And, and it's a simple book. It's, it's a book that offers up simple pleasures. It offers a small mystery, who's Beanie Ferris and will we catch him? And it offers up a couple of opponents, Beanie Ferris, the previous manager of the hotel, Danny Rugg, who's probably the worst actually because that kid is just a pile of malice. Just absolute constant malice afterthought, that kid. And, uh, and, and a great many people who constantly cheer their children on for doing the things with the best of intentions. They, they'll sometimes scold their children, like when Bert decides to go rambling off of a train that stopped on the tracks chasing after Beanie Ferris, as though he, at something like 12 or 13, could possibly capture a grown man. Um, but it has that that childish triumph of, I was trying to do something good, and it turned out well, and people think I did well. And there's something encouraging about a book that says, yes, you should try to do good things, you should try to do the right thing, because if you do the right thing, people will appreciate that you were trying to do the right thing. And... While it's an overly simplistic view of the world, um, and absolutely something that, you know, children should at some point learn about moral shades of gray and the road to hell is paved with good intentions and all of those cliches and ideas and, and things that make up the foundation of reality, there's also something to be said for encouraging that simple view that if you try to do well by people, that it will be appreciated. And to have a book where the kids are not misunderstood by the adults, that what they try to do, the adults actually get. It's nice. It's, it's this uplifting feeling of, I tried to do something right, and even though it didn't work out, people appreciate what I was trying to do. And uh, that's all I really have to say about this book. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you next week.